Wall Street Journal, Thursday, July 22nd. What's news? Business and finance. Biden's selection of the next leader of the Fed is likely to be a choice between keeping Powell, who enjoys broad support in markets and uh, among lawmakers, or replacing him with one of his well-regarded colleagues. J.P. Morgan's board granted CEO Diamond on retention bonus in the form of 1.5 million options that he can exercise in 2026. U.S. stocks climbed with S&P 500 and Dow both gaining 0.8% and the Nasdaq advancing 0.9%. Assets under management at Ant's flagship money market fund fell to their lowest levels in years as the company faced pressures from Chinese regulators. Musk said that he and his rocket company SpaceX hold Bitcoin and cryptocurrency he generally supports despite having concerns about its environmental impact. Greater demand for medical devices, drugs, and consumer health products helped boost Johnson & Johnson sales and profits. Coca-Cola raised its outlook for the year as reopenings lift soft drink sales. ESPN said anchor Maria Taylor is leaving the network after the two sides failed to reach an agreement on con contract extensions. Worldwide, states unveiled a $26 billion settlement with the nation's three largest drug distributors, McKesson, American Source Bergen, and Cardinal Health, and drug makers Johnson & Johnson to resolve thousands of opioid crisis lawsuits. PG&E said it plans to bury 10,000 miles of power lines to reduce wildfire risks throughout Northern California at an estimated cost of up to $20 billion, reversing its earlier stance. Uh, the battle between vaccines and the Delta variant of coronavirus is coming to a head in the UK and is being closely watched by the rest of the world. Pelosi rejected two Republicans put forward to serve on the Democratic-led select committee investigating the January 6th assault on Capitol, prompting McCarthy to yank his other three selections. The opinion page on A17, Bookshelf by Sally Sattel. Looks like a great book. First, Do Less Harm, Undoing Drugs. The book is by Maya Salavitz. Salavitz. Looks like it's uh, 372 pages on sale or full price at $30. 50 years ago, Richard Nixon declared what came to be known as the War on Drugs. The first of its two major campaigns was aimed at disrupting supply lines from the cacao and poppy fields abroad to dealers in the United States. The second was aimed at reducing demand, discouraging drug use, especially among teenagers, and providing treatment to those who had succumbed to addiction. Both efforts continue today with varying degrees of success and failure. The second one, in particular, over time, has required a change of tactics. It turned out that when it comes to treatment, not all users want it, and even many of those who do may drop out of treatment programs. What to do about those holdouts? People who have no intention of quitting drugs or who, having started in a program, find the prospect of quitting too daunting. This is where harm reduction comes in. A classic example is clean needle distribution, a practice that slims the odds of drug users becoming infected with hepatitis C and HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Harm reduction workers meet people where they are at, as the slogan goes, without judgment. The approach is part of a larger effort to mitigate the effects of drug rehabilitation or prohibition e.g. the reluctance of users to seek medical help out of fear of arrest or to enter programs geared towards abstinence. The effort extends to providing apartments the housing first approach where drug use is condoned. The idea is to embrace users and nudge them towards social functioning, even towards abstinence, but on the client's timeline. Science journalist Maya 
Salavitz has been an avid participant in the harm reduction movement. Since her day of heavy drug use and undoing drugs, she tells her own story and others the first popular account of the movement's people and politics. In 1986, the 20-year-old Miss Salovitz was living in New York's East Village, having been suspended from Columbia University for dealing cocaine and now injecting cocaine and heroin. At the time, she didn't know that needle sharing put her at risk for HIV when an acquaintance warned her against sharing needles and, if she did share, urged to run bleach through the syringe she was furious that such information wasn't widely known. Three years later, shriveled to 85 pounds, she had freed herself of her addiction with the help of treatment and was eager to get on with my life. Most of all, she wanted to be a journalist and spread the better information about AIDS and addiction. She began contributing to The Village Voice and Newsday, working as a producer at PBS and eventually wrote or co-authored several books, including Unbroken Brain in 2016, in which she argued that addiction is the product not of a diseased brain, but of a variety of forces, including family, peers, culture, genes, and chemicals. Early in Undoing Drugs, we are introduced to a social worker named Edith Springer, a former drug user herself, now regarded as the goddess of harm reduction. After meeting a man from the United Kingdom who was running a project that handed out clean needles, Ms. Springer began distributing bleach kits in four lone sections of the Bronx and Brooklyn. In the 1980s and 1990s, Ms. Salovitz reminds us the war on drugs enjoyed wide public support, and almost all addiction professionals insisted that abstinence was the only path to salvation. Unsurprisingly, Ms. Springer met with hostility and anger as she tried to advance the idea of harm reduction, as did others. A Puerto Rican activist, Yolanda Serrano, who organized hunger strikes in the AIDS ward at the Rikers Island Jail, demanding medical attention for inmates, a San Francisco consortium of rebels and researchers, who promoted the idea of cleaning needles with bleach, and the late Chicagoan Dan Big, who helped get a medication called naloxone, an antidote for, uh, to opioid overdose, out of the hospitals and onto the street. Needle, um, by reframing drug policy to target harm rather than highs, Ms. Slavitz writes, such activists popularize once radical ideas and forever alter the debate. And indeed, harm reduction has become more mainstream. Only this March, Congress appropriated money specifically for programs that distribute clean needles and other supplies intended to protect users from themselves. Deeply researched and character-driven, undoing drugs is a vivid social history. Ms. Slavitz, who sees harm reduction as radical empathy, alludes throughout her narrative to the rights of drug users. Surely, she implicitly asked, they have the right to be treated with dignity, to receive proper medical care, and to have access to pertinent facts. The answer is yes, but one has to wonder, are there no responsibilities alongside such rights? Ms. Slavitz tends to present even the more radical form of harm reduction as an unambiguous social good. But addicts exist in a social context, and what may help one person may hurt another. What of the other residents placed in a housing-first facility who want to stay off drugs but are sabotaged by their still-using neighbors? What about the streets of San Francisco and Seattle, where harm reduction workers appear to condone tent encampments and parks meant for children and tolerate drug dealing and harassment of passerbys? The champions of harm reduction tend to be silent about such matters, and their silence is often taken for complicity. Ms. Slavitz might have grappled with the tension between helping addicted people and comp compromising the well-being of others. There is a lot at stake. Officials and legislators in West Virginia and Indiana have acted to limit or shut down needle exchanges, despite evidence that such programs do curb disease transmission. Other states might well follow suit. An especially worrisome possibility, as new government data show that overdose deaths climbed 30% between 2016 and 
between December 2019 and December 2020. Undoing drugs makes the long struggle of harm reduction activists come alive and, along the way, shows why their most obvious success shouldn't be rolled back. Dr. Sattel, a psychiatrist, is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a visiting professor of the Vigilus College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University.